Paul's second mission trip got off to a rocky start as he and Barnabas argued, then finally split to go their separate ways. But Paul set out with Silas instead and picked up Timothy along the way. And as they traveled, they also picked up a new vision, a vision that led them farther west into a brand new continent. Welcome to the Bible Study Hour, a radio and internet program with Dr. James Boyce, preparing you to think and act biblically. When you set out to follow God, there's no telling where you'll end up. In Acts 16, Paul ends up meeting with some women in Philippi. One of them becomes a believer and hosts the first house church in Europe. Let's listen now to Dr. Boyce. This is the time of year when most of us begin to think about vacations. But I had a most disturbing thought when I was thinking about our study, and that is that there is hardly a reference in all of the Bible to vacations. I can't think of any vacations in the Old Testament. The only thing that even comes close, perhaps, is the Lord himself, who from time to time would take his disciples off a little bit. They'd spend time together praying. I guess that would correspond to what we call a retreat, and yet it isn't quite a vacation. Actually, throughout human history, most people in most periods of history never had a vacation, and generally that was for physical reasons. Nobody had the money or the leisure to enjoy one. You had to struggle day by day simply to stay alive. At any rate, that occurs to me, I don't know why, but that occurs to me when I think of where we've come now in our study of Acts and find here in these verses that we're going to look at now that the Apostle Paul was setting off on a second missionary journey. Now, he just finished one, and he'd had a tough time on it. He had been to Jerusalem for the great council, and there had suffered some unfortunate pressure, as I believe, from those who were in positions of authority in Jerusalem. And then he had returned to Antioch, where he had a busy time, as we're to believe, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord. And yet, it's at that point, as it would seem, as we read this, without any break at all, that he gets the idea that it's time to start in on all these missionary journeys again. I think that's great because it tells us really that in the Christian life, at least, whether we take vacations for good reasons or not, there are very good reasons for them, but when we are in the Christian life, ultimately, in the final sense, there are no vacations from what we're called upon to do. We're called to serve the Lord. We're to bear witness to him at all times. No vacation from living a moral life or witnessing And that's what we're to keep on doing until the day we die. Now, the story begins in Acts 15 at verse 36, but it really flows out of that on into the next chapter. As we come to the start of it, we find Paul speaking to Barnabas about starting off on what became the second missionary journey. It was a very great journey. The first one was important simply because it was the first one, first authorized missionary journey, a church actually supporting two men as they started off, and John Mark was one. He went along, three of them all together on this task. But in terms of the cities that were reached, we would have to say that that was really just a small beginning. Some churches of Galatia and Cyprus, a few places like that. It was on this second missionary journey that they got to the great cities, the great capitals of the ancient world. Went to Philippi, Thessalonica, Athens, Corinth, and then Ephesus, a number of the most major cities. It is interesting that as it starts, Paul is the one who seems to introduce it. He says to Barnabas, let's go back and visit the brothers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. It's a modest beginning, and it's one that we can't help contrast with the earlier call to missionary activity, where we're told that the Holy Spirit spoke to the church at Antioch and said, separate unto me Barnabas and Saul for the work I have for them. 
Some people have made a contrast between that earlier call and this and have supposed, I think quite wrongly, that this was something that Paul dreamed up of himself, but it wasn't of God. Earlier, it was of God, so they went and they were blessed and the argument would go, this was Paul's idea, and so they began to have troubles. I think that's utterly unfounded. The reason why they didn't need a second calling of the Holy Spirit at this point is that they didn't need one. They'd been called to be missionaries. Once you're called to a task, you don't need to be called and called and called and called again. That was the task they had. They had made a first journey, but it didn't fulfill the mission. They had been back. They'd followed the wishes of the church in Antioch and going to Jerusalem. And now, in fulfillment of exactly the same mission, Paul wants to start off again. As a matter of fact, it's the way he phrases it. He says, we went out on that first journey, we visited all these areas, we founded churches, let's go back and see how the brothers are doing. Our task isn't done just because we've been there once. So I ask the question, I wonder if you think of the Christian life that way. I think we Americans especially need a challenge of this nature because we tend to think that if we agree to teach a Sunday school class for nine months or ten months, we've done a great deal. And then we're ready to stop and have somebody else do it. Or if we're elected to a board of a church, well, we serve, but as soon as we can, we're glad to get off the board and, and get back to our leisure or, or a variety of things that we're glad to do as long as it's short term. And I think we need to see that when we're called to something, at least as I understand it from Scripture, we're called to a lifetime commitment. Well, they started off on this journey. I want you to see that there were a number of new things involved with it, and that's the outline, as I understand it. First of all, I want you to see that there was a new alignment, that is, a new alignment of the missionaries. Secondly, I want you to see that there was a new worker. In fact, there were several new workers, but one who comes into the story midway along. Third, I want you to see that there was a new vision, a new field opened up, and they had a new call to it. And then finally, the last point, the result of it all is that there was a new church. Now, let's go back to the beginning and look at this new alignment. It came about as a result of a disagreement between Paul and Barnabas. Paul and Barnabas had started out on the first journey together, and they had taken John Mark. John Mark was a young man, a relative of Barnabas. When they got into difficulty, so we must suppose, John Mark decided that this was not for him. And so he turned around and went back. We don't find any words of Paul at that point, but he must have been bitterly disappointed in John Mark. He must have regarded it almost as a betrayal of the mission. Because here, when Paul says to Barnabas, let's go back and visit the churches that we founded on our first journey, and Barnabas says, fine, and let's take John Mark with us, Paul says, not on your life. John Mark failed us once. We started out with him. He quit. This is no time for quitters. This is a time for men who are going to hang in there through thick and through thin, regardless of the difficulties, and who will make it to the end. I will not countenance John Mark's presence with us on the mission. And Barnabas said to Paul, Paul, that's not right. He was a young man. He's still young. Young men make mistakes. He failed. That's true. But it wasn't a terrible mistake. He just got tired or he was worried about the difficulty. I think we should give him another chance. No, said Paul. Yes, said Barnabas. And the text says they got into quite a tiff about it. It's not really reflected in our English translation. Our English translation tends to tone things like that down, but it really was quite an argument. At any rate, it was a strong enough argument that Paul and Barnabas separated. These two great missionaries, these saints, the kind of people which in an evangelical church you bring up into your pulpit on Missionary Sunday and you say to everybody, this is what you should be like. These two men, Paul and Barnabas, actually had to divide up and go separate ways. And so Barnabas took John Mark and went to Cyprus. We don't hear more about him, but the history of the church says he stayed on Cyprus and died there, an old man. No doubt he had a great ministry. John Mark later was called by Paul to go on to Rome, where he was at the time, and that seems to suggest that perhaps Barnabas being older had died by that time, but we don't know. At any rate, that was one of the missionary teams. And because 
Barnabas and Paul couldn't go on together, Paul turned to Silas, another leader there in the church at Antioch, and the two of them set out overland to do what Paul had proposed originally to do with Barnabas. I asked the question, who was right? Was Barnabas right to insist on taking John Mark, or was Paul right to say, no, in this missionary enterprise you can't have quitters? I asked the question only to say this, the Scripture does not give us an answer. Nothing in these verses to suggest that Paul was right or Barnabas was right, no doubt. We feel a certain amount of regret that they had to split up, but even that is not condemned by the Scripture. This is just something that happened, and in the final analysis, the end result, it was quite good. Because John Mark did prove himself in the end, even Paul acknowledges that, because in Second Timothy where Paul is writing to Timothy, whom he picked up on this very journey and who is carrying on a lot of the responsibility for him in some of these very cities, he wrote about Mark and said he's profitable to me for the ministry. Bring him along. So John Mark redeemed himself. And as long as we're talking about an end result of the dispute, we do discover, don't we, that as a result of it, instead of there being one missionary team, there were now at least two. I guess that's one way of founding churches. You can have First Baptist Church, and they can have a split, and then you have a Second Baptist Church. That perhaps isn't the best of all possible ways to go about it, but at least there is another church, and God does bless them. And at any rate, that's what seemed to happen here. So, as I say, there was a realignment, and there were two teams, and so it was Paul and Silas, rather than Paul and Barnabas, that started out overland to visit these churches. Verse 41, the very last verse of chapter 15, said they went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Now, Syria was the area where Antioch itself was located and to the north, and Cilicia was the southeastern area of what we call Turkey, where Tarsus was located, where Paul came from. Where do these churches come from in Syria and Cilicia? That isn't where they visited on the first missionary journey. They had gone the other way around. They had gone west to Cyprus, north to the coast of Turkey, inland to Antioch of Pisidia, and then back east as far as Iconium, Derby, and Lystra. But that didn't get as far as Cilicia. And now they were going the other direction, overland from Syria through Cilicia, but they had not yet reached the towns of Iconium, Derby, and Lystra. And yet here they're visiting churches. Where did they come from? Well, it indicates perhaps that there was other missionary activity going on things that Luke himself does not tell us of in the letter. Or it may be, since Paul was from Tarsus, and there was a time when he was there, that is, after he had had to leave Damascus and had visited Jerusalem briefly, and then it had to leave there, before Barnabas went and called him back to Antioch to serve in that great church and that great capital city, perhaps a period as long as seven or eight years. Maybe it was during that time that Paul himself founded these churches. Luke doesn't tell us about it, but if the latter were the case, certainly Paul was encouraged as he started out on this journey, visiting territory that was very familiar to him and in which he had labored earlier to find that these churches were still going. Some ministers like myself spend most of their life in one church. Others travel around and start churches here and there, minister in different churches. It must be a great blessing to those that have ministered in a variety of places to visit those places from time to time and find that the work is still going. I have one experience like that. When I was doing graduate work in Switzerland, my wife and I started an English-speaking church in the city of Basel. And over the years, I've had opportunity to go back there, and that church is still going strong. That is a great joy. When I was there, we thought that was a great church. It had 35 people. But today, it has perhaps 150 or 200 people. It has a different character, as one would expect, and yet... It still has a strong witness, and whenever I hear about it, my own heart rejoices. And so must Paul's heart have rejoiced when he visited the churches. Well, that's the new alignment. In the first paragraph of the 16th chapter, we find a new worker. Now, there was already one new worker, and that was Silas, because Barnabas and Paul had divided up. But here we find one that they discover in the course of their journey and invite to go along. 
He's this man, Timothy. It's the first place in the New Testament that we find him. A man whom, as Paul writes about him, must have been at times a bit uncertain of his abilities and talents. A man who perhaps was somewhat overshadowed by Paul and his brilliant mind and forceful personality and readiness to speak. I tend to think of Timothy as being chiefly a pastor, one who was well able to minister to the people that Paul, first of all, reached through his preaching, certainly who had wisdom in building up churches, handling disputes, counseling those who had difficulties. This is what Timothy was like. You might think that Paul, being a strong character as he was, might have looked down on Timothy and said, well, Timothy's all right, but you know, Timothy isn't quite like me. Matter of fact, Paul did just the opposite. Paul thought most highly of Timothy. We know, for a number of reasons, the way he writes to him in the letters, of course. But then, of course, when you're writing to people, you generally say nice things. What perhaps is even more significant is the way the Apostle Paul writes about Timothy when he's addressing other people. We're going to see that they got to Philippi. It's part of this passage. And it's interesting that in the letter to the Philippians, which Paul wrote later, he did comment on Timothy and his character, and he said something that's really worth reading at this point. I'm reading from the second chapter of Philippians, verse 19 and following, where Paul says this, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. Now notice, I have no one else like him, one who takes a genuine interest in your welfare, for everyone looks out for his own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself, because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me, and I'm confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. Paul says a number of interesting things about Timothy in that brief paragraph. He says he's unique. Nobody like him. Some of our versions say someone who is like-minded. That can mean a number of things. One thing it can mean is that he thought like Paul himself. Didn't have the same personality. He hadn't been given the same gifts. He had a different assignment. But so far as the missionary enterprise was concerned and the building up of the churches, here was one uniquely like-minded with the Apostle Paul. That's a wonderful thing. He says, secondly, that Timothy is concerned for other people. Isn't it wonderful to have somebody who's concerned for other people? Paul, it seems to me that he's speaking of our own time when he says, you know, everybody looks out for their own interests. He could be describing our city, he could be describing our country, our town, our time, because that is what people are like. It's just selfishness. Me first. It's what sin has done to the human race. And here was someone who was so under the influence of Jesus Christ, so filled with his spirit, that he really was concerned about others, and he put their interests before his own. And then he says he also minds the interests of Jesus Christ. You see, it's possible to have somebody who's interested in other people, but not at all within a Christian framework. A good counselor, for example, not at all a Christian can be interested in other people and help them, but who is not interested in the concerns that interest Christ. Timothy was not like that. He had his spiritual priorities right. He had his values right. He put other people before himself. And furthermore, says Paul in this passage, he works well with other people. You ever known people that can't work well with anybody? They're lone rangers. They do a good job, but all by themselves. Can't get along with anybody else. Don't know anything about teamwork or working that way. Well, he says Timothy is not like that. Timothy might not have been the best of all pioneer missionaries, but he was certainly a good pastor. And that is what Paul commissioned him to as he gave him the responsibility for some of these churches. So as we look at this second missionary journey, we have, first of all, a new alignment, new missionary team, and now a new worker in Timothy. I guess it meant that Silas replaced Barnabas and Timothy replaced John Mark, at least in the way the Apostle Paul and his team functioned. Now in verse 6, we come to the heart of the passage, and this concerns 
what I've called a new vision. It's this vision of the man in Macedonia who challenged Paul and those who were with him with the words, come over and help us. I've already mentioned William Ramsey several times, a man who studied this area of the ancient world very carefully and then looked at the book of Acts in light of what he knew about the town's history and geography of Asia. And Ramsey traces this very well, and as he does, it's easy to understand what was happening here as Paul made his journey across this area of the world. He had started out from Antioch and had pursued a generally westward direction, passing first of all through Cilicia and then through the towns of Derby, Iconium, and Lystra in the southern portion of Galatia. And taking that western road, he would have, if he had continued along it, have proceeded eventually into Asia, where Ephesus was located. Eventually, of course, he did get to Ephesus, but the other way around. It's interesting, however, that as he made this westwardly approach to these great cities on the coast, we're told that the Holy Spirit held him back from the preaching. It was guidance, you see, but it was guidance of a negative sort. So since he couldn't go west, he tended to make his way along the northern end or edge of Asia, eventually trying to turn further north and a bit back east into Bithynia. But when he tried to go into Bithynia, the Spirit of Jesus, as it says in verse 7, forbid him from doing that as well. So he was cut off from the west and south and from the north and east, and the only thing he could do is sort of press on between the two in a direction which inevitably brought him to the coast at Troas. And all along the way here, he was not really freed up to preach the gospel. I said that's guidance of a negative sort, and I want to stress that because often in our lives we have exactly this kind of guidance. We speak of it as closed doors. And you know, we don't like closed doors. We find closed doors very, very frustrating. We say to God, God, what do you want me to do? And we look in this direction and God closes the door. And so we get a little bit down about that. We said, I want to serve and God won't let me do it. And so we say, well, God, what do you want me to do? And we look in another direction and God closes that door also. And so we get even more depressed at that point. There's a third door, a fourth door, we get frustrated, and I suppose if it goes on long enough, we get angry at God. We say, God, why are you acting that way? I, I notice as I'm saying this, looking out over the congregation and knowing the lives of some of the people who are here, that some of you are going through exactly this, and particularly at this time of year. You've been looking for a job here or there, and you're just not sure what direction God would have you take. The point I want to make is that closed doors, negative guidance is nevertheless true guidance. And if we can learn anything from the Apostle Paul, you find that what he has done here is keep him from a sphere of activity to which he was not called in order that in God's due time he might come to an area where God would provide rich blessing. We really ought to hear that. When God closes doors, it's not because he has nothing for us to do. He doesn't want us to take a vacation. But it's because he wants to keep us from getting into an area in which we are not called in order that we might proceed to the area which he has ordained for us to work in and where he'll bring great blessing. So they got to Troas. While they were there, one night Paul had this great vision. You see, the vision was God's leading, but no less were the negative things we find before. The significant thing about this paragraph is that three times over, Luke, who is writing, it stresses God's guidance. First of all, in verse 6, the Holy Spirit said no. Again, in verse 7, the Spirit of Jesus said no. And then finally, in verse 9, there came the vision. Two no's and a yes, but you see, in each case, God was leading. And Luke is emphasizing here that this is what God was doing. Why is it that we engage in world missions? Church has talked about it for years in its greatest periods. It has stressed missions and has stressed it in very strong language. Why is it that we engage in the missionary enterprise? 
Well, there are a number of reasons. One reason is that Jesus Christ has told us to do it. We call it the Great Commission, and it's repeated over and over again in the New Testament, once in each of the four Gospels toward the end, and once again at the very beginning of Acts, which we've already seen earlier in our studies of the book. I sometimes say if God says something once, we should pay attention. If he repeats it twice, we should give rapt attention. What if he says it three, four, five, or more times? Obviously, that's something we dare not overlook. And that's what we have in this commission. Somebody once talked to the Duke of Wellington about a missionary effort, and he said, well, the Great Commission is the marching orders of Jesus Christ. You do it because he's the commander-in-chief. And the Duke of Wellington, the great general, understood that, and he marched, and so must we. So that's the first reason. But it's not the only reason. A second reason is the love of Jesus Christ. Paul talks about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He says, the love of Christ constrains us, verses 14 and 15. You see, it would be important to go if it were only because Jesus has told us to do it. We'd have to do it. But that would be a sad thing if we did it reluctantly or only, as it were, under the compulsion of our master. Here I am to preach the gospel. I don't want to be here, but I guess I have to be because Jesus told me to do it, and he's stronger than I am, and I suppose if I don't do it, I'll get in trouble, so here I am. Well, that would be a sad thing. But you see, Paul, who well understood the marching orders of Jesus Christ, nevertheless also understood the sweet compulsion of Christ's love. The love of Christ constrains us. Christ's love for them, yes, but Christ's love for them expressed through me. Paul loved those to whom he was sent with the gospel, and so must we. There is nothing that so commends the message of the cross as the love of Christ seen in the one who proclaims it. One of the reasons why many of us are so ineffective in our witnessing is that we really don't love those to whom we speak. Paul did, and he was effective. But then in the third place, let me point out that it's also the need of the world that compels us. The command of Christ, the love of Christ, but also the need of the race. The world is perishing apart from this gospel and has many, many other needs besides social needs, physical needs. The world is confused intellectually. It doesn't know where to turn. It doesn't know how to deal with the problems. Why politics demonstrate the failure of the world and its systems to us every single day of the week. I find it significant that it is largely in those terms, that is, in terms of the last of the three motivations, that this vision to come over into Macedonia is given. This man of Macedonia did not say to Paul, Paul, God tells you to come. He did not say to Paul, Paul, don't you love us as much as you love those who are in Asia? No, he said, come and help us. We need help. We need help. I wonder if you've thought of your missionary effort or your witnessing to a neighbor in those terms. You say to me, you know, it's difficult to witness because so many people today don't want it. You try to talk to them about the gospel and they're hostile to it. Well, that's true. You say they don't seem to need it. That is true. Many people are self-satisfied in their wealth and their material prosperity and other things, and they just don't want to give attention to anything that would upset their values, or bring them to be a servant of Jesus Christ. But if that's the case, let me say that you may well be neglecting, as the church down through the centuries has, to its shame, often neglected those who really are hurting, those who really have needs, and who know that they have needs. The gospel has spread in times of its greatest prosperity among the masses who had crying social, intellectual, medical, and other needs because Christians recognized the needs, went to them because they loved these people, and it was in that context that the Holy Spirit blessed, and many thousands upon thousands came to Christ and were added to the church. Maybe one reason why the Protestant churches in this country in particular are not prospering, is that they are going to those who are prospering. And what they ought to do is go to the needy, those in the poor areas of the country, those who have great social needs in the city, and love those people for the sake of Jesus Christ. Well, 
Paul heard that vision. I suppose the same night he shared it with his companions, and the result was they crossed over from Asia into Europe, and the gospel began that march which eventually has brought it to ourselves. I can't help but notice that in verse 10, for the first time now in the book of Acts, we have the first person, we, written by the narrator, as an indication that now he has joined the party. Those who have studied Acts have pointed this out, that here in the 16th chapter, again in the 20th chapter, and also in chapter 27, you find the narration changing from the third person, he did that, they did that, to the first person, we did that. And undoubtedly those who conclude that here Luke is involved are right. Luke was uh, Greek, a Greek who spent a lot of time in Philippi and then later traveled on with Paul. Probably he's a Greek who came over to Troas from Macedonia and met Paul there, there for the first time, was influenced by his message and who decided to travel on with him. Paul came to love this man. He called him later the beloved physician. Apparently other people did as well. And when they got to Philippi, apparently they left Luke there behind because later on the narrative changes. It's not we at that point. It becomes he and they. They did this and he did that. And then later, when they get back to this area, they pick up Luke again, and then Luke travels with them all the way to Jerusalem on the ship and by land. And then finally, when Paul is shipped off to Rome, Luke goes along as well, because again, it's we, we, we. Well, we've seen this new alignment of the missionaries. We've seen the new worker. We've seen a new vision, a new call. The bottom line of all this is the founding of a new church. Because they got to Philippi, and there there was no synagogue, so Paul couldn't follow the pattern he usually followed. He used to go into the synagogue because there there were people who were interested in religious things, and he began to teach from the Old Testament, first to the Jews, then to the Gentiles. There was no synagogue here in Philippi. But Paul found down by the river a body of people, women, under the leadership of a woman named Lydia, who were there to worship together. And Paul recognized this as a proper place to start, and he went and began to teach them. They responded to the message, Lydia especially, a leader, a businesswoman, very able woman apparently, who had taken leadership in the church, responded, invited Paul and the others into her home, cared for them, gave them the place to stay, and, and that home, that home of Lydia, became the new church, new church building, the house church of this first Christian colony in Europe, in this city that was a great colony of the Roman Empire. That's the bottom line of it, you see. It, it's, it's not founding churches in the sense that we often think of when we think of church buildings. Nothing to that at all. There are churches in the world where there have been great church buildings and the congregations have faded away and now Churches are just monuments, in some cases museums, in other cases wrecks, or they've simply been torn down. It's not the building, but it's the people. And that's what it's all about. What is life about? Is it getting recognized by other people? Is it fame? Is it satisfying yourself? Is it being happy? Is that what life's about? If that's what your idea of life is, you're doomed to frustration and great failure because those things have a way of slipping through our fingers like sand. Now, what history is about, what life is about, is God calling out a people to himself. That's why Jesus came. He came to die for his sheep, and he said, I'm sending my messengers into all the world to call those sheep from all the sheep pens in which they're found into my one great big flock. And there's going to be one flock and one shepherd, and those people for whom I've died, who have been called by my messengers, are going to spend eternity with me in heaven. And before that, they're going to have a little taste of eternity, a little taste of heaven here within the fellowship of the church. I challenge you to be part of that commission, to be part of that challenge, that great plan of God in history, to make your life count something, not just for life, because that'll pass away, but for eternity. Let us pray. Our Father, bless this study to us.
we're so caught up in the world and its values, and we certainly are caught up in the rapid pace of our time, and we tend to think that what's important is what the world tells us is important, and only because we don't spend enough time in your scriptures. Our Father, teach us from a passage like this, orient us to what you're doing in order that we might become tools in your hands for building that which will last throughout eternity, architects and builders, as it were, for that great city that has foundations, that city founded upon the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. You're listening to the Bible Study Hour with the Bible teaching of Dr. James Boyce, a listener-supported ministry of the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals. The Alliance exists to promote a biblical understanding and worldview, drawing upon the insight and wisdom of Reformed theologians from decades and even centuries gone by. We seek to provide Christian teaching that will equip believers to understand and meet the challenges and opportunities of our time and place. Alliance Broadcasting includes the Bible Study Hour with Dr. James Boyce, Every Last Word with Bible Teacher Dr. Philip Riken, God's Living Word with Pastor the Rev. Richard Phillips, and Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible, featuring Donald Barnhouse. For more information on the Alliance, including a free introductory package for first-time callers, or to make a contribution, please call toll-free. 1-800-488-1888. Again, that's 1-800-488-1888. You can also write the Alliance at Box 2000, Philadelphia, PA, 19103. Or you can visit us online at AllianceNet.org. For Canadian gifts, mail those to 237 Rouge Hills Drive, Scarborough, Ontario, m one c 2Y9. Ask for your free resource catalog featuring books, audio, commentaries, booklets, videos, and a wealth of other materials from outstanding Reformed teachers and theologians. Thank you again for your continued support and for listening to the Bible Study Hour.